Well, hello everyone. Um, welcome to the live. So, wow, six thumbs up already. We haven't even started. You guys are expecting more than I can deliver. Well, <clears throat> as you might have seen from the title, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about a controversial, controversial issue concerning the creation or the evolution of the earth and how soil science fits together with that. I got to shut off my phone here. It's, it's watching the live. So um, Country Homestead Preacher, it's good to have you here. Voon Child, good to have you here. And uh, so I'm going to start out Arkansas Woodcutter. Hopefully you're somewhere parked and safe and not uh, dealing with weather. I got... It's going to drive me crazy. I got to figure out how to shut that off. There we go. Sorry about that. I hope you're somewhere safe. Arkansas Woodcutter, Joe Serrano, welcome to the live Cajun Hydroponics. Sorry for your loss earlier. Um, excellent to have you with us. F&P Farms, good to have you here. Homestead Aquarius, welcome. This thing is going to talk to me this whole time. Now I got it. All right. So I want to read to you. This comes from the first book ever written about um, how soil was created. It's an ancient text. Perhaps you're familiar with it. I'm sure some of you are. Country Homestead Preacher, I'm sure you're familiar with this. Well, this is the first text ever written about soil science and where it all started from. We won't read the whole thing. I'm just going to read a few selective excerpts. So, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form, and there was a void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness, and he called the light day, and he called the darkness night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. Now, we're going to skip a little bit here. You can go back and read this. This is from Genesis chapter 1. You can go and read the parts that I skip, but I'm going to jump ahead to um, day 3, and God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and he, and he gathered together the waters, and he called uh, them he called the seas, and God saw that it was good. And he said, let the earth bring forth grass and herbs yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding the fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herbs yielding seed after its kind. All right, I'm going to jump forward again. Uh, we're going to jump all the way to day six. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish and the seas and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image and he, the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them and he blessed them. And God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth on the earth. And God said, Behold, I've given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth and every tree in which uh, 
is fruit yielding seed, and you shall have it for meat. Now I'm going to I'm going to stop right there, and I'm not going to read um, any further. But I encourage you to double check everything that I'm about to say. Just go back to Genesis on your own. So there's a lot of dispute about this chapter and what it means. And as I get into soil science here, and as I start to talk about soil formation and types of soil and the, um, the uh, classifications of soil, we come to a, a little bit of a problem for Christians. And that is that you always hear this expression that, oh, this took place and then it took millions even billions of years for the next thing to take place. Now, I'm not, I'm, I'm not really quarreling with anyone's beliefs. I, that's not my point here. My point is to show you that if we take that biblical text from Genesis and we compare that to what science knows about the earth and its creation, they fit together perfectly. You don't have to believe in billions and billions of years of evolution of the earth. I actually believe that the earth is probably around 6,000 years old. Now, I'm open to believing about 10,000 years, but if you get more than 10,000 years, there's some problems with the geology, and there's some problems with the uh, biology. Now, I know a lot of people are thinking, well, John, first of all, you know, Christianity, that's a religion, but science is science. Well, listen, science knows an awful lot of stuff that they have to change their mind about later on. And so I start with the scripture, and then I apply the evidence, and it fits together very nicely. So that's where we're going to go this evening. We're going to talk about mostly the, the science, but I will make reference to how that fits in with creation uh, as we go along. So the first thing that I want to do, well, let me stop and say hi to some people, Twinbrook Farms, Walsh Farms, Simply Jan, Gail, you know what, Recyclable Homestead. I'm, I'm not going to try to do that. I'm going to say hi to everybody. And uh, if, if I miss somebody, I'm sorry. I'll try and pick you up as, as we come along. But as we begin to look at soil, now I did a video this summer on, on soil where I talked about soil being uh, sand, silt, and clay. But I didn't, I, I had to cut so much of it out that um, I've always felt like I kind of cheated the video. So, I want to talk about soil, silt, sand, or rather um, sand, silt, and clay. And I want to talk about how it all works together to form loam, because loam is a mixture of sand, silt, clay, and organic material. So that's what we call soil. Once you add the organic material, it becomes soil. Without the organic material, I, I suppose it's dirt, but it's it's really just inert. So, um, the way that soil comes about in its natural evolution, and I do believe in evolution, I just don't believe in billions of years of it, and I don't believe that anything has evolved from one species to another. So, as the earth evolves, as it changes and changes, and eventually uh, heaven and earth will be no more. But we have rocks that begin to weather and deteriorate and fall apart. Now, we, we call those rocks the parent material of soil. So if you're in an area that has a lot of, of felspar, you're going to have some red soil. If you're in an area that's got a lot of quartz, well, you're going to have kind of a gritty soil. If you're in an area that has a lot of limestone, well, then you're going to have a, a fairly um, sandy, gritty type soil as well. Now, I happen to live in an area that has a, a silt loam 
or maybe a loam. So uh, when we describe soil types, we make a triangle. And from the top of the triangle down to the left side, we have the clay um, component. And on the right side, we have the silt component. Actually, it's reversed, but I'm looking at the screen, so it's it's reversed to me. So let's see. Well, let's just do it that way. Uh, it would be on the, yeah, on the right side, you'd have the silt. On the left side, you'd have the clay. And at the bottom, you've got the sand. Now, anything from about 50 up, if you, if you were to number that 1 to 100 on each side, anything from about 50% clay and up, we just call clay. So if 50% of the soil is clay, we just refer to it as clay. Below that level, you've got, on the right side, you've got silt. On the left side, you've got clay. And right down the center of that, you have what we call loam. So what you'd like to have is loam. Loam is going to be somewhat of a balance between um, sand and silt with a little bit smaller amount of clay. And so if you've got, and most of us do, most of us have a little sand, a little clay, and, and a little bit of silt. And then if we have no organic matter on that soil, we have to add that. But generally speaking, you're going to have some organic material. But what kind of sand? What kind of clay? What kind of silt? And that has to do with what was the, the parent material. But the parent material isn't the only thing that determines what the soil is. So the parent material, let's say you've got felspar, well, then you're going to have um, quite a bit of sulfur in your soil and, and some other things. But then the climate makes a big difference. And the reason that the climate makes a difference is if you're in an area that's very hot, the parent material is going to break down more quickly. If you're in an area that is extremely cold, then the parent material will break down, but it'll break down into larger bits. So in areas where it's very hot, you end up with quite a bit of, of uh, fine sand, but still sand. And I think sand is... You know, I, I was going to give you the micron size, but I, I I don't remember, so I'm not going to try to give you that. But um, it's broken down into so many microns. And so in areas where it's very hot, you're going to get a lot of that sand because the parent material is going to break off in crystals. In areas where you have a lot of cold, you're going to have larger parent material. Here in the Midwest where I am, uh, we have quite a bit of silt. Now, I happen to be sitting in a unique area. My field used to be a peat bog. So I have what is referred to commonly as organic soil. It's no longer a living peat bog. There was a, a I'm told there was a fire in the 30s that burned the peat bog, and it burned it way down deep into the soil. It burned for a year or so, just smoldered and, and created problems for a long time. Fitzpreacher Farm, welcome. And I don't think, Arkansas Woodcutter, I think I said hi to you. If I didn't, hello. Yeah, I did. I did. I got you. Um, so the, the climate's going to make a difference as to what type of soil you have. And then the, the native vegetation is going to make a big difference because that's where you're going to get your organic material in. So if you've got a lot of trees around, you're going to have uh, a more organic soil. So in my case, the native vegetation was the peat bog. And so I've got a fairly organic soil. The other thing is the topography, and we're not going to get into that. That soil classification, we're not going to get into that too much. But um, Grace Family Homestead, welcome. And you're not late. I'm just babbling on. Um, if you're on the side of a hill, you're going to have a different kind of soil. If you're down in a valley, uh, you'll have, if you're in an old river valley, you'll have alluvial soil. And... Um, so 
your soil is going to be different depending upon what the area around you is like. I live in a very flat area. Uh, it, I mean, anyone who's ever driven across Illinois uh, knows that there's nothing to see here. It's it's flat. Until you get down by the Mississippi Palisades, you're not going to see anything that isn't flat. There's a few bumps here and there, but really it's it's pretty flat. Get into Wisconsin, there's actually some pretty good hills, not mountains, but hills. But here we don't we don't have much topography. So when the floods receded, see now I'm supposed to say when the glaciers left, but really when the flood receded, remember the flood of Noah, right? That's when God saved Noah and his family and one of every creature, every living creature on the earth. When the floods receded, you got these alluvial deposits and we can see those in the soil. And, and you know, uh, we either have to attribute them to a glacial melt or to a flood receding. And if you look at the Grand Canyon and how it's made and the, all of that, it looks more like a receding flood than a glacier. But let's not get too caught up in that. We're talking about soil. And then the last thing is time. And this is where the problem comes in with geologists and the Bible. They say, well, it takes billions of years for these things to happen. Well, that reminds me of a story. There was a young man who was talking to God. It's not a true story, but it's a story. And he said, God, what's a, what's a million years to you? And God said, well, it's a minute. And the young man said, well, God, what's a million dollars to you? And he said, well, it's like a penny. And the kid said, well, can I borrow a penny? And God said, sure, in a minute. God is outside of time. And so when we talk about the billions of years that it took to create the earth, God isn't restricted by that. And anybody who thinks that God is restricted by that just doesn't know the God of Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac. He doesn't know the God who sent his son to redeem the world. And so if you stop and think about what it would take for God, you know, what he did to create the heavens and the earth, he didn't just create rocks and soil and sulfur and molybdenum. He didn't just create people and animals. He created an ecosystem. He created a system that is self-supporting. Animals cannot create their own food. Humans cannot create their own food. We can grow it, but we can't create our own food. Plants. Plants and some algaes can create, and some um, mushrooms and such, uh, funguses, can create their own food or can create food. But... If it weren't for the plants, we'd have nothing to eat. God created an ecosystem. The plants, however, they need man. And they need man to interact and to learn how to interact because God commanded Adam and Eve, he said, you're to have dominion over the plants and you're to tend to them and care for them and be stewards of those plants. So how does that answer the millions of years question? Well, God didn't start the ecosystem at some beginning point and say, okay, I've put it into motion and now it's going to take billions of years, but it'll eventually get there. No, he started the ecosystem in its process. In other words, he started the ecosystem not at point one. He started the ecosystem at full bore, everything in process. And so when God created the earth, he both created 
mountains and large bedrock areas, but he also created decayed rock, which is sand. He created decayed sand, which is silt, and he created decayed silt, which is clay. And so each point of that process was part of creation. And so if we look at it, it, it would look like, wow, it takes millions of years for this to happen. But in reality, God created it in process. And he had to. Well, I don't mean he had to as in God is restricted by certain rules, but he had to in order for it to be the creation that he made. It had to begin not at the beginning, but in the middle or in the process. And the reason is each part of the ecosystem is equally dependent upon another part of the ecosystem. The plants can't survive without us. The animals can't survive without the plants. We can't survive without the plants. Of course, after the flood, then God gave permission for man to eat animals. Prior to that, in, in the Garden of Eden, if you read the story, we were vegetarians, or we were to eat as vegetarians. And I'm not going to get too deep into that. I, I could. I like that subject. But I want to keep on point here with soil structure. When we dig a hole in a garden, now you can tell someone by the way someone digs a test hole, you can see how much that person appreciates the soil. If you're going to dig a hole to look at the soil, you don't just go out there and push down the shovel and dig a hole. You dig a small hole and then you chisel out, you fillet off the side until you can see a profile. Now the soil profile can be as little as a few inches thick and it can be as much as, well, I don't know, several feet, yards, miles deep, uh, the soil profile goes from the top layer of soil all the way down until you hit the parent material, which is bedrock. So in different places, you're going to hit bedrock in different areas. Where I live, we have um, rock plates, um, right at about 35 feet, uh, we have bedrock. And I know this because when they drilled our well, they had to stop at 35 feet. They couldn't get any further. And the geology of the area says that that's as, that's as deep as you can go. So uh, we have a 35 foot deep well. And um, what that means to me is that's where my water tables going to be at. Between that bedrock and somewhere above that is where my water table is going to be. So if you were to dig a hole in my backyard to look at the soil, soil profile, the first plane or first um, horizon of soil that you're going to see is what we call the O-horizon. Now, geologists don't use the O horizon. A geologist is going to have an A horizon, a B horizon, and a C horizon. And then he may put in an E horizon somewhere along the lines. But a plant person, so a, if, if he's a soil scientist or she's a soil scientist from a plant perspective, you're going to have an O horizon. The O horizon is the organic horizon. Now, in most cases, the organic horizon is only a few inches thick because it has to stay aerobic. Uh, once you get below um, the area that can stay aerobic, you're going to have soil down to that level, and then from that level on, you're, you're going to have subsoil or dirt. And the reason why I say that is you're not going to have anything, any living biology in there, so it's no longer really soil. But the subsoil is going to be a reflection of that organic level. So the, the, um, the A horizon is going to be your 
let's call it your topsoil, and then your B horizon is your subsoil. And oftentimes separating these horizons, uh, not the O from the A, but oftentimes separating the A from the B, you'll have an alluvial layer. Or perhaps you'll have an alluvial layer between a B horizon, and then you'll have another A horizon underneath that. We refer to that as A2. And you'll perhaps have a B horizon under that. We call that B2. Now, what the B horizon is where the clay starts, where you start to find large deposits of clay. So some of you may be plagued with the idea of you don't really have an O horizon or an A horizon. You just go straight to B. You've got that clay layer. And um, uh, there's a name for that that's called a lenticular soil. So what a lenticular soil is, is it's plates of soil that stack on top of each other. And that's how clay sits. It's, it's like plates of, of clay, and they're thin. And this is why it's so hard for water to penetrate. Now, clay will hold a lot of water, but it's hard to get it to penetrate. Canadian proud, out, proud get outdoors. Welcome. Thank you for coming in. Um, so that um, lenticular soil doesn't let the water through it, and that's the problem with clay soil. But we're going to talk a little bit about what you can do about clay soil. But remember, I said that loam was a mixture of sand, clay, and silt. So if you've got clay, shouldn't you just add sand and silt? No. And, and the reason why is you're not going to be able to add enough sand, and you're not going to be able to add enough silt. Now, what you can do is you can build raised beds and, and solve the problem. And if that's what you're you're looking at, then that's that's great. But if you've got clay soil, probably the best thing to use is gypsum. Um, gypsum is calcium sulfate, calcium sulfide um, without water. I can't think of the, the term for that. Hydrate, dehydrate. So it's calcium chloride dehydrate. Well, the calcium is just sort of an unnecessary, I mean, it's necessary, but you've got plenty of it in your soil. It's, um, it's the, the chloride that you want in there to break up. You'll create a, um, you'll create strata within the, within the clay. It'll break it up. So gypsum. The other thing you can use is sulfur will break up clay to a certain degree, but if you've got really hard, pure sulfur, it, it's going to be difficult. Um, and then, so if, if we think of these strata, though, what we need to do is think about, well, how do we build up if we don't have, if we've just got the clay and we want to build up a topsoil, we need to add the uh the calcium to the soil, but then we also, we want to get some organic matter on the top of that. The problem is as we put organic matter right on the top of clay, it's not going to stick around for very long. It's going to get washed off. And this is, I, I think, um, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm making a joke here, uh, but what do Ruth Stout and Charles Dowding have in common? Anybody know who Ruth Stout and Charles, Charles Dowding are? And what might they have in common? Well, you think about that. Yeah, Amy, um, sheetrock is um, gypsum. So you just, you need to take the paper off it. Well, I don't even know if you need to take the paper off it, but the, uh, the gypsum is, is in the middle. Crazy, uh, Amy's correct, no dig. And so I always say, well, the thing that, Ruth Stout and Charles Dowding have in common is they have clay soil, and that's why they don't want to dig. Um, Arkansas Woodcutter says they're old. Well, I think one of them's still alive. I'm not sure if if uh, I'm not sure if Ruth Stout is alive. I know she seemed old in the '70s when I first started reading uh, in Mother Earth News about Ruth Stout, but. Um, 
the idea that they had was to just pile organic material on top and grow through it. And it, it can work. And if you've got a clay soil, it, it might be it might be something workable for you. Uh, I'm not a big fan of it. And maybe one day I'll talk about why. Um, and maybe the two and a half acres that I garden, that might give you a little bit of an idea as to why I don't care for adding that much organic matter. It gets a little expensive. But, um, oh, I got my note here. I just found my notes. So if, if you think of um, sand, sand is anything greater than 0.5 micrometers to 2 micrometers or micrometers, depending upon where you come from in the country. Silt is anything from 0.5 micrometers down to 0.002 micrometers. And clay is anything less than 0.002 micrometers. So we're talking about, you know, sand being about the thickness of a hair to about maybe the thickness of what would be four hairs. And silt gets down below the thickness of a hair. So uh, clay is actually very thin. Now, the good thing about clay is that clay has a very high cation exchange capacity. And the, the cation exchange capacity is the ability of soil to hold nutrients, but it's also the ability, it's the ability for them to hold the nutrients and it's the ability for the plants to get the nutrients from the, um, from the soil. So the cation exchange rate is the availability of nutrients to the plants but more importantly, it's the plants or the ground's ability to hold those nutrients. So that's a very important part of, of farming, especially uh, my neighbors around me. The, the most important thing they get from their soil test is their pH and their cation exchange rate. So Um, I've talked a little bit, let me, let me go over soil structure one more time. I'm going to use a little bit of a different description of it. This is one that I found that I thought was pretty good. You've got your O, um, your O horizon, which is your organic horizon. And, um, that's made up primarily of organic matter. Then your A horizon, and for a farmer, uh, for a, a, uh, a dirt farmer, that is the plow layer. So we're going to go, we're going to create that break, that transition between the A horizon and the B horizon by plowing. And so wherever the bottom of the plow sits, the bottom of my plow sits at seven inches, I'm going to get a plow pan, and that's going to be the end of my A-horizon. So if I continue plowing year after year after year, my A-horizon is going to end around that seven inches. And then I'm going to have sort of a, it's not really an alluvial level, but I'm going to have a transition point. I'm going to have some, uh, as I plow, some of the heavier material is going to drop out of the tillage and it's going to land on that seven inch mark that I'm plowing to. And that's going to create a plow pan. So now I've got to go through with a chisel and open that up, cut through that plow pan so that water can drain through and so that the roots can get down into that lower level because the roots of your plants will grow seven, 14, 20 inches long. Corn Believe it or not, corn will grow 
as fast going down as it goes growing up. You get just as much root down as you get up until you hit about three feet. And then the roots start to grow horizontally more and they, they don't have quite as much vertical growth down. Your tomatoes will go 36 inches deep in the soil. You won't be able to pull them up and pull 36 inches of roots, but if you're able to carefully dig down like a soil scientist and study those roots and look for the fine root hairs that are coming off of it, they, they could make it down into that level. But if you've got a plow pan where all that hard material's fallen out and you've created that pan, or you have an alluvial level, a natural plow pan, you've got to break through that. Or if that plow pan's at seven inches, that's as far as your roots are going to go. And then you get some dry weather and you're going to have a big problem. So, um, The, and then the B level or the B horizon is uh, where the clay accumulates. And then down below that, you've got the C level. And the C level really breaks up into two spaces, as I think of it. The first is the already deteriorated, broken up. That's the gravel. And then you've got the bedrock, the, the large parent material of the soil. Um, so I'm catching out of the corner of my eye that Jack was talking about no dig and no plow, and maybe that conversation's been going on a little bit. I am not a, in my setting, I am not a believer in no dig. Um, now if I were living down in Georgia, I would probably that, that would probably be something that I would be interested in trying. You've got clay soil. If you can build up your organic matter on top of it, build up some, some of an A profile on top of that uh, clay, then you can possibly begin to actually get microbes that will dig down into that soil. And if you've got red earthworms in your ecosystem, they'll dig down in that soil, and so will any of your um, any of your bugs, cicadas, and that kind of thing dig down. They break up that soil, and then what happens, um, there's a name for that, and I can't, I can't think of it offhand, but they, they burrow holes down, and then silt and sand fall into those holes, and that allows nitrogen to come up and water to go down. One of the one of the problem and roots to go down. One of the problems is, hi, Lori. One of the problems is that when you have that plow pan, specifically nitrogen will still go through that clay. It'll pass right through it. Now, clay has got a good cation exchange capacity, so it'll hold on to a lot of it, but unfortunately, the roots can't get it. So you need that clay to be broken down so that, and, and, Mixed into the soil, you need a loam soil where that's all mixed together. Yeah, uh, Arkansas woodcutters mentioning that when he did some archaeology, they found insect uh, burrow holes and things like that. Boreholes is what they're called. Um, so, so that's kind of how soil structure goes and what is it how do you tell so if you go out to your garden how do you tell what kind of soil you have go out to your garden and grab a piece of soil about the size of a golf ball and you want it wet enough that you can that it's wet but squeeze any excess water out of it you don't want it to be filled with water. You want it to be relatively dry, but moist. And then what you want to do is you want to spread it around in your hand. And if you, if you feel grit, then there's sand in the soil. If it feels a little slimy, a little soapy, then there's some clay in the soil. And there's almost certainly some silt in the soil. 
But if you ball it back up, hold it in your hand, and then push it out like a ribbon, you know, just kind of push it through your hand, if that ribbon comes out about two inches, you've got a lot of clay in your soil. If it breaks off at about three quarters of an inch, you've got a good amount of silt in your soil. And if you can't get it to go out at all, you probably, um, you probably have a lot of sand in your soil. Hello, Bulls Garden. Welcome to the festivities. Um, so a couple of things that can, can work against us in our soil is, um, oh, wait, I didn't, I didn't finish my, my thought on that. So um, if you've got If you look at the profile of the soil, and I'm talking about in your, your beef, the A profile and the B profile, if you look in it and you've got a lot of small square chunks of dirt. Now, this is when the ground is relatively dry and you kind of break it off. If it breaks off in, in kind of angular square clumps, kind of blocky clumps, um, That's what they call a prismatic structure. And if the if the if it breaks off into kind of rounded clumps, then that's called a columnar structure. And the difference between them is the columnar structure is an older soil. It's more broken down. It's more um, the soil, the, the water will penetrate it well. So A lot of interesting facts or ideas here, but what do we do with it? So the main thing for you and I, the main thing that we can do is try to amend the soil using organic material or using minerals. And there are, there are a couple of things. We mentioned drywall or gypsum. Uh, also known as Plaster of Paris. Now, Plaster of Paris is unfired gypsum. Um, wallboard is fired gypsum. doesn't matter. A kiln, kiln fired. It doesn't matter. Once it's burned, it's no good. But either of those uh, will help to break up clay soil because it, it adds an aggregate that's just slightly bigger. If you put sand in it, you create almost a concrete until you get enough sand mixed in. And at that point, if you're, if you've got a clay soil and you want to get some results, you're going to have to till it. If you've got a very heavy soil, and this is why I'm not a no-dig farmer, if you've got a really heavy soil, it's going to compact. And the problems that you get with compaction can be really bad. So, for example, um, thank you, Amy. For example, if I don't plow, my ground will get so compacted just because of the snow level, just because of the weight of the snow, especially since the snow hit before the frost went into the ground, and it hasn't left. I'm really hoping that... Uh, you know, most of the snow is um, sublimating or um, evaporating. And so I'm hoping that I'll be able to get in the field in maybe six weeks and get the ground turned over. Now, the key is you, you if you bottom plow, you've got to plow it, and then you've got to probably till it at least twice to get it workable, and then maybe rototill it one time. If you till it too much, you make it too fine, and then it compacts again. And if you till it when it's wet, it'll compact. So the decision to be a no-dig or a dig gardener is mostly based on the type of soil you have. And in my opinion, or 
not my opinion. In my experience, what I have experienced is the more organic material you have in the soil, the more necessary it becomes to turn that soil over. Now, to give you an idea, and I've said this before, I've got 24% organic material in the top 14 inches of my garden. 24% organic matter in the top 14. Average soil is 6 to 8% organic matter. And the reason I have so much organic matter is because this was a former peat bog. Now, if you go north of here a little bit, they have ground that they just simply call organic soil, and it's got over 30% organic matter in it. Well, the problem is, you know, just think of what, it, what peat moss does. If you, um, if you plant your seeds directly into peat moss, the peat moss will soak up all of that water, and it'll hold on to it. And we've got the same thing here. And so we need, and, and then when it dries out, it'll be hard and compact. And that's why we put perlite in with the peat moss to keep it aggregated and broken up. Um, so at the end of the day, the choice to till or not to till is all yours. Um, I till because I believe I have to. And I believe I have to because in the past when I haven't, I, I end up with huge problems the next year. One of the problems is the ground is so compacted that things won't grow in it. And, of course, compaction is also a result of overtilling. So I understand the arguments. Um, the other problem that I have is if I don't till, I get standing water. Uh, if you till too much, you'll get standing water. I get it. But the biggest problem is, if you've ever had a garden in the Midwest and you've tried to keep it weeded, about the only way you can keep that weeded is through some sort of tillage. Now, shallow tillage will take, take care of a lot of the annual weeds, but to get rid of those perennial weeds, and I would have, if I didn't, if I didn't plow, I would have, because for years I only plowed every other year. And I found that I have to change that. I'm going to plow every year because when I plowed every other year, the year that I plowed, I'd have less weeds. The next year I'd have more weeds. And so it really is, I think, a net benefit to, to till. And for those of you who are not tilling and it works for you, I've seen videos of people that say they don't have a single weed. And I watch Haas Tools. He says, well, we don't really have weeds. Well, I have a lot of weeds. I, I, if I could sell weeds for 0.10 cents a piece, just amaranth, just amaranth alone, I'd be a millionaire. All right. I'm pretty much finished with my presentation. Pete's Little Homestead, hello. Uh, if you guys have any questions for me or if there's anything you want to talk about, go ahead and, and let me know. I'm going to look back in the chat a little bit to see what I was overlooking and ignoring, not meaning to. Jacko's mentioning uh, stones in his soil, and you know any anything that can be aggregate, you know anything that can add some aggregate to the soil is probably a good thing. Jacko says here the definition of a weed is something which grows in a place you don't want it. I agree with that definition, but I have amended that definition. A weed is anything that creates a competition for the plants you want to grow. Because um, if it's creating competition for my plants, it's got to go. And that's how I define weed. But yeah, that's a good definition also. 
Hey, uh, Lori's World or, or Amy, somebody, could you put the website for um, Shed Wars up on the screen? Um, the, the Shed Wars website. And then also, if you haven't gone over to um, the Shed Wars News Network, that's uh, John's son. And from what I understand, uh, he's going to be doing some of the reporting on the Shed Wars to take a little bit of the pressure off of Frank and Tina. Frank did such a great job last year. And uh, so there we got it. The Shed Wars is up there. And go over to the Shed Wars News Network. Get subscribed. I was over there today. There was only 24 subscribers. I was surprised. I also noticed that there have been about 90-something, 90 93 or 94 entry videos made for Shed Wars. So um, pretty exciting, I, I guess. And if somebody's in here that knows when the, uh, when the draft is going to be officially, uh, if they could put that on, I, I don't remember. It's over 100, Arkansas says. Yeah. Um, when is, when is the draft? So Jacko says chard has become a weed. You know, what becomes a weed to me is tomatoes. Um, Gail says March 10th and 11th. So a week, a week away. All right. I have a Shed Wars 21 playlist in my in my play on my page, whatever that's called. Uh, Amy uh, uh, Gail put it up March 10th and 11th. Oh, uh, Mark is saying it's the 12th and 13th of this month, and one short week <clears throat> we'll have the draft, and then the season starts on the 23rd. Well, my season will not start on the 23rd. I can guarantee you that. Um, we've still got, well, we're down to maybe six inches of snow on the fields. Most of it's evaporated. I've still got some pretty good-sized piles. I'll probably, if I get some time tomorrow, I'll probably spread the piles out in the driveway and let them melt. Um, but... Uh, Very good. Um, well, let's see. I'm going to go back in the chat a little bit, see if I... missed anyone or anything. Thank you, Amy. Amy wrote down that this was good information. I, you know, I hope you can take some of these random ideas and, and make use out of them. Um, a lot of this is stuff trivia that I've come across through the years and some of it's stuff that I've been working on right as we go. Um, I'll also give you a little bit of an update. Uh, Sunday, I've got a, a video coming out. Um, most likely. Uh, and in that video, I'm going to be talking about my germination chamber. I've made a few adjustments to it. I installed that circulator fan that I was talking about, and I'm having a problem with too much humidity. So I'm going to have to add a heater besides the fish tank heater, something that will heat um, heat the the chamber and with less humidity so working on that um homestead country homestead preacher says enjoyed the live very good stuff thank you and um if you haven't been over to country homestead preachers site uh i think isn't it six six o'clock is when you have your bible study put it down there let people know um I, I enjoyed the other day when I got on to a little bit of it. I'm usually not home in time, but uh, when I can get on there, I will. And 
suppose there's no reason I can't watch them afterwards. I haven't been doing that, but perhaps I can. Yeah. 6.30 daily Central Standard Time, Country Homestead Preacher. It's good stuff. Uh, the other day he caught my eye with a post about Dr. Seuss, and so I went on there and I listened to what he had to say, and real level-headed, good stuff, so I appreciate it. Thank you, Country Homestead Preacher. So who else is in the house here that I missed? I think I said hello to everyone. Um, we were 35 today for a high. They said it was supposed to get up to 40, but it didn't. At least as far as I know, it didn't. Um, so... You know, Jacko, one of the other things that leaving stones in the garden does, and for me this is important, is it creates a good heat cycle through the nights. When it gets cold at night, those rocks will stay warm. Now, as someone who does a lot of tillage, um, that can be a bit of a problem because the rocks can get up in the tiller. Jan is asking, where is Mother Goose? She's sitting over on the couch. I don't know if she's watching the live or not. She's been working a lot lately, and I think she's kind of tired out. So, Well, thank you all for coming out. I'll let you out of class a little bit early. The bell's not going to ring for another five minutes, but... We'll close it down, and I'm not going to sing my way out like I did last time. But I will say, uh, again, thank you. You're welcome, uh, Voon, and thank you to all of you. And have a good night. That kind of goes with that song from the other day. So you all take care of yourself. And Mitzvah Shem, I'll see you again. I'm Chicken Johnny. Eat your vegetables.